There once was a master who was asked by another Zen monk, what is the secret teaching of Buddhism? So the master told the monk to wait until everyone had gone later in the day, and he would reveal to him the secret teaching of Buddhism. So the monk waited until finally everyone was gone, and then he asked the master, now that everyone is gone, will you please teach me the secret teaching of Buddhism? So the master took the monk outside into the garden, and he showed the monk the bamboo. And the monk said, I do not understand. So the master looked at him and said, Look at that bamboo. What a tall one there. What a short one there. And in that moment, the monk was enlightened. Greetings, comrades, and welcome back to another Comrade Cast. And today, I have an absolutely phenomenal episode for you guys. It's one I've been working on for a while, and one I am extremely excited to bring to you guys. So as I mentioned, this has been a show that I've been working on for a while, something that I've been wanting to bring in and add a little bit more depth and complexity into some of the things we talk about. And today, I want to talk about how we can relate some of our political values to a value system that is more structured and certainly more spiritual than you would consider to be politics. And obviously they don't consider politics and religion to be things that mix very well, which I certainly have agreement for. However, I am personally not a Buddhist in any sense. I don't consider myself to be a Buddhist, just someone who's very interested in the philosophies and concepts which are attached to Zen Buddhism. And one of the things that has always spoken to me about Buddhism on a sort of philosophical level is that Buddhism is always more self-word facing. Buddhism is not a religion which really asks people to go out there and proselytize it, asks people to go out there and spread the word of the Buddha or anything like that. All Buddhist teachings are all about looking inward and all about discovering your true self and all about self-improvement and betterment. For it would not matter if you enlightened a thousand souls in Buddhism. If you could not enlighten yourself, then it doesn't really matter. And one of the things I have always thought that conservatives have done much better in their political rhetoric is bring in a lot of these more sort of spiritual ideas into the way they talk about politics. And a lot of these spiritual ideas really resonate with people on a fundamental human level. And I'm hoping that I can give a little bit of a counter perspective, but from the East rather than from the West. So without further ado, let's jump into our actual episode. So in case it wasn't obvious by the title and the intro, what we are talking about is the politics of Zen Buddhism and how to bring in sort of Zen concepts into a philosophical discourse and think about some of some philosophical ideas through the lens of Zen Buddhism. Overall, it should be an extremely interesting and informative video for a lot of you guys. If you guys aren't familiar with a lot of Buddhist concepts, hopefully we can at least give you some sort of an introduction in this episode. And we're obviously going to be talking about them <laughs> so we can move on to connect them to more political ideas. So one of the very first concepts that we have to talk about before we talk about anything in regards to uh, Zen Buddhism is how it is taught a lot of the time. As much as people may think, Buddhism and specifically Zen Buddhism are not taught through reading of scrolls and tomes and the writings of ancient monks or anything like that. The way these concepts are taught are through a method called koans. And koans are like little stories which are meant to elicit an emotional response. In the way that if you make a joke, if you told the joke well, you elicited an involuntary emotional response, which is laughter. The koan, if you've told it, it is supposed to elicit an emotional response, which they call in Japanese satori, which means awakening or enlightenment or being able to understand Buddhism, to be able to see the world for what it truly is. So these koans are supposed to essentially help you realize some sort of great truth about reality, about yourself. 
we're going to be going through several examples as we continue the episode. We, <laughs> as, as you probably noticed, we started off the episode with a koan. And I'll bring to you another one right now. Like I said, we're going to go through several. But I do quite like this one here. In early times in Japan, a bamboo and paper lantern were used with candles inside them. A blind man visiting a friend one night was offered a lantern to carry home with him. I do not need a lantern, he said. Darkness or light, it is all the same to me. I know you do not need a lantern to find your way, his friend replied. But someone else may run into you, so you must take it. The blind man started off with his lantern, and before he had walked very far, someone had ran squarely into him. Look out! Can't you see where you're going? He exclaimed to the stranger. Can't you see the lantern? Your candle has burned out, brother, replied the stranger. So obviously the moral of the story here is that sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. Obviously the blind man can't account for the fact that his candle went out on the trip because he can't see it. So what his friend was trying to prevent from happening happened anyway. So as we go on, we'll pepper those in. So that's one of the big concepts surrounding Zen Buddhism I want people to understand is that this is how teachings are conveyed is through these various stories and anecdotes. And you might be asking, what is the purpose? What is the ultimate goal of Zen Buddhism? And well, that would depend on who you asked. And I have seen numerous examples given by numerous different people. Personally, my best answer, I think, to give to this question would be that Zen Buddhism is the practice of human beings becoming who they truly are. For us to become in our most sort of natural state, if you will, but even natural isn't necessarily the right word because things in nature aren't always necessarily pure themselves, but we want to reach whatever our uh, unencumbered, our unfettered, pure self is. And I think that there is a very deep longing in our society right now for many people to find themselves to whatever find that pure essence of themselves is. However, it's almost never expressed in this sort of Zen philosophical way. It's always expressed through a much more Western lens. And I think one of the greatest examples of a political movement capitalizing on this want and need for an awakening for some sort of self-idea or direction would be the red pill movement, which has been able to obviously ascertain that there is a very deep longing for an identity, particularly in young men, but not exclusively. This movement has been able to reach out to a lot of young men and help them, in essence, build their egos, which is actually an important first step for what we are going to be talking about today. And one of the things I do want to stress right now, and, and this will bring us into one of the other very important concepts surrounding Zen Buddhism that we're going to be talking about today, which is this concept of ego death. So one of the most important things that over time, um, if you study Zen Buddhism and you study this kind of philosophy, what will become important is the idea and the necessity that we have to, at some point, shed our egos because our egos are an illusion, a reflection of ourselves as they truly are. And to come to grips with ourselves as we truly are, we have to, at some point, kill this ego. But here's the thing, you can't start on the path until you have an ego to begin with. So you have to get out of the gate, so to speak, first off, before you can even start walking this path to begin with. Which is why I want to talk about a lot of these concepts, not necessarily in opposition to Western, more ego-filled concepts, but more as the next step of, right? This is the next step you want to go to once you have exhausted all that these um, more basic ideologies and philosophies can give you. And I really want to stress is that I am not an enlightened person. Like I said, I don't claim to be. I don't even claim to be a religious or Buddhist person to begin with. These are just concepts that I find extraordinarily interesting and fascinating 
and well worthy of contemplation and in some cases bringing into my everyday life. Yes, so just to say I have not reached enlightenment. The place where I am right now is struggling with the concept of ego death. That is where I would consider myself to be. And I understand it is an extremely difficult thing because so much of our socialization has had the concept of an ego pounded into us basically our entire lifetimes. In any case, that's where I consider myself to be personally in relationship to Zen Buddhism and these kind of concepts. In any case, this is the kind of thinking for people who are going to be asking themselves, well, what's next? What's next after I've established this ego? And we've talked about this before. I do think that this kind of red pill, manosphere movement, whatever you want to talk about, is really in the twilight of its era. And I think that young men everywhere have exhausted all that they can out of that particular movement. And for the young men out there, I do hope that when it comes to your time to move on, that you will take the good and leave the bad when it comes to the red pill movement. The fact of the matter is that I believe this is one of the fundamental keys to success in life in general, which is the ability to recognize the good of anything and take that with you and leave the bad, right? There's no sense in leaving the 10% of something that is good when you can just take that and just not take the rest of it. You can leave the 90% that's bad, right? And take the tiny bit that's good and vice versa, right? You always want to remove the 10% bad from whatever 90% is good. Don't want that useless 10% hanging around causing problems. But you understand hopefully what I mean here, even with a movement which I disagree with, I do think that there are small good parts that people can take from it and leave the rest, which is overwhelmingly bad. And the fact of the matter, I think, is that Zen Buddhism and Zen philosophy can actually help you hone this skill in taking the good and leaving the bad. But that's more of a, a topic for another conversation, not necessarily for what we're talking about right now. But I do think that now that this movement is in its twilight, there is going to be a lot of men and women out there searching for the next step. And hopefully we can talk a little bit about that today. Because here's the thing about enlightenment, about Satori, is that it involves an aspect of yourself that a lot of Western philosophy seems to eschew or pretend doesn't exist, which is that a lot of these Zen concepts, the concept of Satori, like we talked about, is an involuntary emotional response. It exists outside the world of logic and reason, and if you continue to exist entirely within that world, you will not understand everything. Conversely, by living your life entirety in the world of logic and reason, you will not be able to understand the world around you. Because when it comes to enlightenment, there's no sort of mathematical formula or algorithm which can bring to you the understanding, which can bring to you that enlightenment. Even when it comes to reading and studying, there are limits to the written word and the spoken word because... The thing about words is that words are not reality. Words are symbols of reality. And at some point, you have to escape the mere symbols of reality and actually go into reality itself to understand what's going on. No matter how much you read, no matter how much you study, unless you actually get out there, you're never going to understand it. And of course, that's not to say that there is no use for wisdom or knowledge or written stories or academia or what have you, the important thing is to understand that these things have their limits. And ultimately, no book can walk the path for you. No amount of studying can walk the path for you. Only you can walk it yourself. This concept is best illustrated to us through the famous French painting, The Treachery of Images. If you're listening, this is the painting of a pipe which says in French, below it, this is not a pipe. And the meaning here is that this is not a pipe. This is a depiction of a pipe. This is a picture of a pipe. Not a pipe in and of itself. 
if you actually wanted to understand the essence of a pipe, viewing this picture would only get you so far. At some point to truly understand it, you would have to actually go out, pick up a pipe, examine it, look at it, sense it, feel it, to truly understand its nature. As try as you might to understand the world through a lot of these Western philosophers, you will never be able to get there because they only understand essentially half of what it means to be a human being. A lot of these Western philosophers eschew any kind of emotional reaction or any kind of emotional status or any kind of emotional state. But here's the thing about human beings. We're not Vulcans. We're not robots. We are emotional creatures as well as logical and rational ones. And the way to true self-growth and the way to true understanding is being able to reconcile those opposites that exist within us all. To reconcile both the logical and emotional, to reconcile the good and the bad, to reconcile the pure and the selfish. But it's oftentimes through our emotional responses that humanity is redeemed. If you watch a lot of sci-fi or whatever and you have humans interacting with aliens, it always seems to be like our emotional quirks and our unpredictabilities that beat aliens at the end of the day, the cold, rational, calculating aliens or whatever you want to call them. It's not through our logic, our technological prowess. It is through our unique and emotional responses that make us distinctly human that the aliens are defeated. One of the things that I've always loved about Eastern philosophy is that the more and more you dig into it and the more and more you understand it, especially when you compare it to Western philosophy, in the famous words of Eleanor Shellstrop, sorry Western philosophy, but ya basic, Eastern philosophy is just more holistic in the sense that it incorporates all of the aspects of being a human being. It doesn't ignore any of what it means to be human at all. In any case, that will bring to the end of our discussion around basic Zen Buddhist concepts. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we can bring them into a more political realm and tie them into our political discussions. So let's dive into one of the first concepts I want to think about and talk about which is the character I have right next to me. This is the character Mu, which means negative or in absence of. Not so much negative in, you might think, of like the moralistic way as in good and bad, but negative in the more mathematical sense, in the sense that something exists or it does not exist. You could also, sometimes this is translated as maybe non-existence or absence or things along those lines. Either way, it is a very important philosophical concept for Zen Buddhism because obviously for nothing to exist, something has to exist. But there are a great deal of questions as to what exactly the true nature of Mu is. What is the true nature of nothingness? How does nothingness even exist? Can nothingness even exist? And what does that actually look like? Let's take, for example, that you wanted to find a way to get to a place that is completely silent, that is totally, absolutely, completely silent, and you wanted to experience what true silence sounds like, true absence of sound. What do you do? You're obviously not going to be able to hear it probably in your house because as soon as you try and focus in on the silence, you're going to hear your, your refrigerator buzzing, the lights buzzing, traffic outside, whatever. So you're like, okay, not going to find it here. So we go out, we go out into the wilderness and we decide, okay, we're going to get away from all of civilization, all of humanity. This is how we're going to experience silence. So you go out there, that's the middle of the night. And of course, it's not silent. You still hear the wind blowing through the trees Maybe you hear a creek in the background, you hear owls hooting, you hear other signs of wildlife. The point here being is that even completely away from 
all of the noise and all of the clutter of human civilization, you're not going to be able to find that silence. This isn't doing it for me. Maybe there's another option. And you do some research and you learn that Microsoft actually has a room that is considered to be the quietest room ever created by humans. Considered to be the quietest place in existence. So quiet that sound cannot get in and it cannot get out. So you think, finally, okay, now I can go and I can experience silence. So you go there and you go into this room and they lock you in the silence room and you think, oh God, finally I can experience silence. But nope, you can't. Because do you know what starts to happen to people in the silent room? People hate being in there because they start to literally hear the blood flowing through their body. They start to hear their heart pumping. They start to hear their blood flowing. They start to hear their bones scraping against themselves. You start to hear all the little noises that your body itself makes. And then that itself starts to apparently drive a lot of people crazy. A lot of people don't like to be in the silent room for more than an hour or so because it starts to like really weird them out hearing all these bodily noises. So even in our most thoroughly engineered environments, we still cannot hear silence. So what is pure silence then? Can we actually attain it? Well, the answer is no for a couple of reasons. One is because silence, like many concepts in our lives, follows a wave pattern. It rises up like a wave and then recedes and then rises up again and then recedes and then rises up and goes on like that ad infinitum. This is the same with silence. It never truly disappears. Rather, it just recedes in the face of noise. And then, of course, the opposite may happen where noise recedes in the face of silence. So in this way, the definition of silence contains its opposite naturally. The world of pure silence, as we could create a world of pure noise, just as it would be equally futile to try and create a world of pure good, it would equally be futile to worry about the creation of a world of pure evil because this is simply not the way it works. Good can never completely eliminate evil. Evil can never completely eliminate good. All that can happen throughout these cycles of our lifetime is that good may recede in the face of evil and vice versa. But what happens when you try and clamp down and eliminate the good all that happens is that your totalitarian measures just create more and more space for that good to inhabit. And, the, and in a similar way, when we talked about the silence room, the absence of noise creates such a void that silence can't hold on to it. Eventually, that void has to be filled with some sort of noise. And in this case, the very sounds of the blood running through you and the bones creaking in your body are what are going to fill that void of silence. So you might be asking yourself now, what the hell does this have anything to do with politics? Well, I want us to consider and to think about what would the politics of nothing really entail? Can the politics of nothing actually exist? And this is a point that is talked about a lot in left-wing circles you'll hear phrases like everything is political and in a sense that is true but i think it's very poorly framed because people don't like hearing especially if they're an apolitical person that their actions may have a political connotation even if they don't want it to even if they don't choose it to they don't like confronting that notion but the absolute worst thing you could do in that circumstance is tell somebody that you're there a bad person because they're not thinking about the political ramifications of their actions. That is not a very smart thing to do to a politically uninclined person. But rather, the point here is to get people thinking about their actions and if they may have a political connotation, whether they want it to or not. Because, well, I do believe that you can be a centrist in a political sense. It is an extremely difficult thing to do because the right and the left politically have their own sort of gravitational forces, if you will. 
and a, a centrist has to basically bounce in the equilibrium of these two gravitational pulls. And the moment that the centrist leans one way or another, they may inadvertently enter the orbit of one of those sort of gravitational political bodies. And then slowly over time, they may not even realize it, that they're, that they are entering the orbit of one political body or another. And of course, you have to bear in mind is that politics are not stagnant. So over time, political values change, propositions change, fights change. And thus, the centers of political gravity on both the right and the left do change over time. So while you may have been a centrist at one point, because these bodies have moved, all of a sudden you're not a centrist anymore, and you don't even realize that you haven't even changed your position, but the politics have changed, and all of a sudden you've entered the orbit of one of these major political camps, and again, not even realized it. Of course, this, as the saying goes, well, you may not be interested in politics. Politics is certainly interested in you. But this is a concept I really want you guys to turn over in your heads and see what you guys can come up with. Is it possible to have the politics of nothing? Or do your politics just recede in your decision making, just like with other things in life? Can you truly be apolitical? I don't think so. And even if you espouse a politics and don't think about politics, your actions will still have political consequences. But the thing, of course, is just because you haven't thought about this or haven't considered this, this doesn't make you a bad person in any way, shape, or form. But it is something to consider, especially if we are talking about politics through the lens of Zen Buddhism. You have to talk about the concept of karma, which is that as we make decisions in our lives, good or bad, our decisions are having consequences which reverberate out into the world, whether we want them to or not. And our actions are always cosmically being judged on this notion of karma. And not only that, <laughs> actions for our past lives are also being judged and calculated. But the point here being is that no matter what you do, all of your decisions, all of your actions, all of your choices will have a karmic impact. You cannot make an action which has no karmic impact. And the important thing here is to get people to think about the political impact of their choices. Personally, I believe that the, one of the best things you can do in order to make better ethical decisions in your life is to think about the consequences of your actions. Because if you're not the consequences of your actions, you're effectively leaving out half of whatever your decision making should be. I believe that this very simple act of just thinking about the consequences, reasoning, reasoning out your actions to their natural conclusion in and of itself will help you make better choices. And the point here is just to make people cognizant of the fact that no matter what you do, all your choices have an impact. And maybe you should think about that Maybe you should think about the impact that you're having, regardless of what you're doing. So let's move on to the next topic. But before we move on, I want to read another koan to you. This one states, A Chinese woman once remarked upon another woman who appeared to have two souls. One was always sick at home, while the other was always in the city with her two children and her husband. Which was the true soul? All right. So the next concept I want to bring into our political lives is a Buddhist concept called radical acceptance. Maybe you guys have heard of this. It's something that has permeated outside of Buddhist thinking and thought. For example, I took psychology. That's my background. It's my education. And something that we learned during my education and, and counseling was a counseling technique called radical acceptance, which of course was based off Buddhist philosophy. And by the way, this uh, image that you're looking at, the image of this woman, I just typed in the AI, it's AI generated image and I just typed in radical acceptance. That's all I did. And this is what it came up with. I'm like, holy crap, that's dope as fuck. It's going in the show. 
So anyway, radical acceptance is the art of simply accepting things the way that they are to as an extreme extent as you can. To understand that there are simply parameters about your life, about the world, about whatever you want to say, that you simply cannot change no matter how hard you might try. And you will be much happier, much freer, and be able to come up with much better solutions to these problems if you simply accept the fact that you cannot change these things and work around them. So when it comes to politics, I have found a lot of personal fulfillment over understanding which aspects that I can change and working around it and going from there type of thing. So let me give you an example of how radical acceptance has changed some of my own personal political thinking. We've talked a little bit about guns on the show before, but this is probably the most in-depth we've talked about it so far. One of the things I've mentioned before is that when it comes to guns, I actually dance around the political spectrum a little bit. For example, when you would go to gun legislation in the United States, I am very firmly with the Democratic Party. I think that the gun laws in the United States are completely out of control. But there's a reason we can't change that. No, I'll, I'll come back to that, but I'll just lay out my personal perspective. I definitely think that that country needs more gun control, needs more gun safety, more gun regulations. Absolutely no question about that. However, when we move up to my country of Canada, I'm actually more in alignment with our conservative party on the issue of guns. Because particularly, I used to think that we did guns really well in this country until Justin Trudeau became the prime minister. And he gutted a lot of the very, in my opinion, common sense legislation around guns and made it much harder and in some cases outright banned various firearms with no real purpose besides gaining political points. So pre-Justin Trudeau, I was always very happy with Canadian gun laws and I thought that they were a very good example of what I'd call kind of common sense gun legislation, which is that uh, if you wanted to get a gun, essentially you would have to go submit to a background check with the RCMP and then you have to also do a safety course, uh, depending on which gun uh, license you're taking here in Canada. There's one kind of for, like, there's a non-restricted version and a restricted version. Non-restricted version is for more like hunting rifles and stuff. And then the restricted version has handguns and stuff like that. So anyway, you decide which license you want. You go, you take the test, and then you have to have a safety certification. And then once the background check comes back, um, you're able to have your gun. And I think that this is a very reasonable process to go through to get a firearm. To me, a firearm is a privilege, not a right. But that being said, I think that the way they handle guns in a place like Japan or a place like the United Kingdom where guns are effectively banned for everybody except in very minor circumstances and very niche circumstances, that to me is absolutely way too far. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you can show that you are a responsible citizen, you can show that you're able to intelligently handle a firearm, that you can pass a basic safety course around using a firearm, I see absolutely no reason to deny you that right. That's where I stand. I think firearms are a privilege, not a right. And I think so long as you can show some basic common sense understanding around the use of firearms, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be able to own one. But going back to the point about the United States and radical acceptance, that cannot happen in the United States. And the reason is, is because in the United States, guns are in a protected legal class, which simply doesn't exist in any other country on the planet. In the United States, gun ownership is a right, and that automatically puts something in a different political class than, as we talked about, a privilege. A right is something which cannot be taken away from you in basically any circumstances. Although, of course, we do have <laughs> some circumstances where rights are taken away from you, usually when you've proven that you are incapable of playing nicely with others. So, in any case, due to the fact that gun ownership is a right in the United States, it basically makes it impossible to set up 
a kind of robust system like we had here in Canada to undergo safety checks and that kind of stuff. You can do it depending on a state by state basis, but it's something that could never be applied across the country in general. And because guns are in this legally protected category, because they're in the category of rights, it makes it impossible to really get effective gun legislation done on a, on a federal level. It's not going to happen in the United States just to the way, just because of the way the political system works. The Second Amendment is never going to go anywhere because even if you were to try and change the Constitution, get a, co a convention of states together, I don't think there is any conceivable scenario where you get enough states to agree to abolish the Second Amendment. It is simply not going to happen. So where does that bring us now? So because of that, we simply have to accept the status that guns have in the United States. We have to accept that this is the political reality in the United States. And where does that leave us? Well, under the principles of radical acceptance, I think this leaves us in the position of, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And if I were a LGBTQ plus person in a Republican area of the United States, in a rural area of the United States, if I were a minority in one of these areas, if I were any other type of marginalized group, I would arm myself yesterday. Because all those people who hate you and want to exterminate your existence, guess what? They're fucking armed. And there is unfortunately no political mechanism left in the United States that can be used to disarm them and create a level disarmed playing field, leaving the only option to become fluent in the use of firearms yourself. That being said, though, if you live in a more democratic area, you live in a more blue area or a more urban area where police and law enforcement and other emergency response teams are very close at hand. You don't have to worry about this anywhere near as much. I would say the odds of anything happening to you are incredibly slim in terms of some sort of political violence against you, who is in a marginalized community in a Republican or rural area, get armed. And this is becoming a surprisingly less controversial take on the left because I do think many of us have gotten to the point of radical acceptance when it comes to guns in the United States. I think the prospect of a lot more armed transgender people is certainly going to become a reality. And because of that, we were joking on the discord. I was joking, like, I wonder how quick it's going to be before the conservatives try and ban the sale of firearms to transgender people. I bet you it will come. It will come. The moon which hangs above us all is the same moon. Yet all the rivers and mountains below it are different. But each are happy with the harmony and variety of its placement. So let's end this episode off by talking about a few techniques which you can use to try and find your true self, to discover your true self, whatever that force happens to be. Obviously, one of the key tenets of Zen Buddhism and what I have right here, I, I can't believe I almost forgot to show you this to you guys. This is the character for Satori, which is enlightenment. This is the Japanese character. But what are some techniques that you can try and use to reach that enlightenment, reach that discovery of your inner self? Well, let's talk about a few of them before we go. The first thing I think that you can do and, and something that I have started to do much more of is absorb the reality around me, begin to really focus on some of the sensations and what's happening around me. I tend to be the kind of guy whose head is always in the future. I'm always thinking about what's going on next, what's going to happen, what I'm going to do next, and not so much focused on what's happening around me as much as I should be. But one of the things I've noticed is that by trying to draw myself into the present more, it is helping me become a little bit more, not just cognizant of the world around me, but almost cognizant of some of these principles themselves. 
But once you do that, it's important to start asking questions about yourself and reflecting on yourself. And we can do this in a number of ways. One of the ways we can do this is through meditation or simple self-thought and self-reflection. But in order to find ourselves as we truly are, whatever that is, is the only way we are going to do this is effectively through a series of experiments where we try, try and get away from who we are now. And as we try these different experiments, we realize that there are certain aspects that we like, certain aspects that we don't like, certain things that fit us, certain things that don't. And over time, we develop this image of who we are. But of course, the next step is once we develop the image of who we are, we start to break it down and ask ourselves, why did we choose these aspects about us to carry on with us? What was it about this certain thing that really resonated with us? Why did we do this? And as we break ourselves down and examine the choices we've made in our lives, this is the process of ego death, understanding why we took these symbols on as parts of ourselves, and then, of course, breaking them down. Alan Watts has a very good way to describe this. It's kind of like an onion, but imagine that you didn't understand what an onion was, and you thought that an onion had a pit inside of it, so that as you're peeling back the skins on the onion layer, trying to find that inner core you realize that, wait a minute, it's, it's just skins. I'm just peeling back skin after skin after skin after skin, and there's no core at the center of the onion. This is what is happening, right, when we are examining these aspects of ourselves that we chose to carry on with. We are asking ourselves, why, why did I choose this type of personality trait? Why did I resonate towards this uh, style of look? Why did I resonate towards this type of speech? And as we reflect on these concepts, we start to realize that we really did it for not even for ourselves, but maybe for other people to try and stand out, to try and look a certain way, to do it for others. So we didn't actually end up doing it for ourselves, even though we thought we did. And then eventually we realize that what our true selves is, is irrespective of all these kind of like hokey things that we tried to hang on ourselves, whatever your true self is, whatever that force really is, tapping into it is an extremely powerful thing to do because whatever our true self is and the teachings of Zen Buddhism, that is an effectively indestructible force that when the sun burns out, the earth is gone, everything you knew and loved is destroyed, whatever your true self is will still continue to exist. And of course, one of the things that Zen masters teach themselves is to read koans and to read stories. And that hopefully if you read enough of these stories, sooner or later that moment of Satori will be reached. And we're going to end this episode. Unfortunately, I'm way over time and under time in terms of what I need to actually edit this and get this out. So we're going to have to wrap things up there. Even though, again, they, there is so much more I could talk about in many of these concepts, there's definitely always a possibility to continue this conversation at a later time. But I'm going to end this episode with yet another koan. This is another one of my favorite ones. And this is another one that is extremely popular. You guys are probably, you guys may have heard of this one, even if you're not into researching or studying these kind of concepts. There once was a monk in a monastery who just for whatever reason could not pacify his mind. He couldn't get it to shut up, basically. No matter what he did, he couldn't get it to calm down. And he continually tried to get the master's attention to ask him, how can I pacify my mind? Please pacify my mind for me, master. And he tries time and time again, he tries to get the master's attention and eventually he does it after repeated failed attempts. He finally gets the master's attention. The master is basically like, okay, what do you want? And the monk says, I need you to pacify my mind. Please help me pacify my mind. And then the master says, of course, I can do this for you. Please find your mind for me. So the monk 
stops and he, of course, searches for his mind. And he says, I, I cannot do it, master. I cannot find my mind. And then the master replies, there, your mind is now pacified. And again, there are many ways you can interpret this story and understand the story. My personal interpretation is that like many things in life, Zen Buddhism teaches that they are an illusion, that whatever your that this mind, whatever it is, is an illusion in and of itself. And it's something created wholesale out of your own sort of cognition. And when the master asked the monk to find his mind, obviously he could find it because it's not something that physically exists. And in that moment, he was supposed to hopefully realize the illusion of trying to pacify his mind to begin with. Anyway, that's all I got for now, comrades. So I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Definitely a little bit different from some of our regular fare. But this is something I have been wanting to talk about for quite some time. And I finally had the opportunity to bring it together in an episode. And with that... This has been the Comrade signing off for now. And until next time, you guys take care.